Marvin Gaye. The Temptation. Easy Wonder. someone 
else. It appears that he begins to doubt. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> We've been in COVID for a year and a half. Isolated. In our prisons. Sometimes the prison of the mind. John, he asked Jesus, could you save her? Or, or should we expect someone else? You know, people ask this question every day. Maybe you're asking yourself this question. Come on. Is Jesus the one? Yes. yes. Come on. Or should I expect salvation from something or someone else? Come on, bro. Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist, asked this question. Great, great. I don't know what's going on with John right here. But it seems that he was starting to waver a little bit. He was starting to doubt. You know, isolation could mess with you. Yeah. You know, they've been studying the effects of COVID on people and being in isolation. Yeah. And they report that depression is on the rise. Loneliness is on the rise. Sadness is on the rise. Yeah. And they've noticed another trend that people in their depression have turned to what the world calls bison. We call it sin. Yeah. 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 And they're doing these in increasing matter. They're drinking more. Drug abuse is up. Gambling is up. Pornography is, if it can get any worse than it already is, up. And why is that? Because people are looking for a savior. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking to the world for a savior, for something to cope, to bring them peace, the pursuit of happiness. People are chasing saviors, but there's only one savior. Come on, God. God became a disciple chasing sin, thinking that sin would, would make me happy. You know, I, I just went after the world. It reminds me of the movie Scarface. There's a scene where in the movie Tony, he's driving a 1965 Cadillac Eldorado, probably made in Detroit. Yep, <laughs> Tops down, and then his car cruising down the boulevard with his right hand, Chico. <laughs> Chico says, do <"Doom." laughs> What you want, Tony? <laughs> What you want to do with your life, Tony? Tony says, Chico. I want the world, Chico, and everything in it. Oh. I was actually just all that with my heart. I wanted the world, and I wanted everything in it. So I chased the world. I drank it up. I was immoral. I pursued what I thought would bring me happiness, the pursuit of purpose. But I could never obtain it. The more I sinned, the more depressed that I got. I refused my heart no pleasure, as Ecclesiastes chapter 2 says. And the more I chased these saviors, the more I chased sin, the more unhappy I got, the more depressed I was, the more lonely I was, and how happy and sad that I was. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I just wish I would have listened to the wisest man in the world. Solomon says, in verse 1, he says, I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasure and to find out what is good. But that just proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? And so I tried to train myself up with wine. And then I just embraced folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. That means he was just being foolish with his body saying, don't do it. <laughs> no, that's not going to be good for you. You ever had that one? Uh, I'm proud. Embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom, but I, I just wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. He goes on to say, I just, I just started building stuff. Green didn't work, pleasure didn't work, so I just built something. I built houses, I built structures, I, I, I had a harem, I had all these things. He says, I refuse. My heart, no pleasures. And at the end of it all, he says, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, when I toiled and fought to achieve, I realized everything is meaningless. Chasing after the wind, 
Nothing was gained under the sun. He says all that, chasing all these things to fulfill you, to make you happy. He says it's it's chasing the wind. You ever try to catch the wind? Yeah. Where's it at? <laughs> you can't do it. He says it's chasing after the wind. If I just would have listened. But I'm so hard headed. You know, Amen. I'm a tell us, bro. Rebellious guy. Okay. Yeah. Really Remember, I said I'd come back to my story. That's right. right. Yeah. Let's go back to the early 1990s. Right. So here I am. I'm in the United States Navy. You know, I'm rebellious. God has to do some crazy things to get my attention. Yeah. I'm in the Navy. I'm, I'm chasing sin, I'm chasing my saviors, what I thought would save me. Literally, in every country I go to, I chase sin. I was chasing sin in all nations. Went to Oregon for 30 days. I partied it up. I stayed way later than I should. And I left home at about 5 o'clock at night. I had to rush back to San Francisco, California, where I was stationed a 10 hour drive to get there by early morning. I had a case of beer in the back of my car, cruising down the road about 85 miles an hour. Cruising down the road about 85 miles an hour, had my cruise control set, starting to get tired. I pulled off the side of the road, grabbed a quick Coca Cola, told my mom, said, Hey, I think I'm okay. She was worried about me. Jumped back in my car, set the cruise control in the fast lane to 80 miles an hour. And started driving. The next thing I knew, I fell asleep at the wheel. Yeah. I was in the fast lane when I fell asleep at the wheel. I pulled down on the steering wheel. I veered across all lanes of traffic at about midnight in Northern California. And I hit a bridge. And I woke up at the moment I hit the bridge. It didn't matter. There was nothing I could do, though. <laughs> My car immediately went end over end, flipped over the bridge. And I woke up in midair. All I could hear was wind. And I'm doing flips in midair over a bridge sitting about 25 feet over water. Uh, my car flips, it lands, and starts to sink under water. And I'm gathering myself thinking, man, is this it? Am I still alive? What's going on right now? And I thought in any moment my car is going to explode. My car sinks under water. All my windows burst when I hit the bridge. I turn to my left in a panic. Water starts gushing into my car at a rate where it's going over my head so quickly that I had just a second to take a breath. And I swallowed half of the breath, swallowed half of the water because it's coming up so I held my, I held that half of a breath underwater, pitch black, dark and cold, which is a spiritual representation of where I was. Wow. <laughs> underwater, panicked, freaking out, couldn't even remember how to take a seatbelt off. And thinking, is this it? God, is this it? Is this my life? And I remember that moment God really spoke to me, not in a voice, but he spoke to me in a way where he helped me get out of that car. I pulled my leg out from underneath the dash where it was stuck. I took the seatbelt off. I swam out my window, swam to shore, stood up there, and just looked at my car in the water and all my stuff. Everything was in that car. Checked myself out. Not a scratch. Wow. I had a little tiny scratch right here. I did. Not a broken bone. Not a stitch to be had. That's not even a cool part of the story. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. I'm recovering. I go back to the ship. I go to the hospital first. They let me go. They can't, no one can believe I'm alive. I'm, I'm thinking about eternity right now. Yeah. Like, says, God says eternity on the heart of all day. Yeah. So I'm sitting on the ship and I'm recovering and I'm by myself in my workspace. And I turn the TV on to relax and watch a movie. And the movie that's on, that comes right on when I turn the TV, is a movie called Hellraiser. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect description of my life. In the movie Hellraiser, the, the scene that was on that immediately got my attention was a scene where this demonic 
figure in the movie whose name is Pinhead. He walks into a church, walks down an aisleway just like this, stands at the altar, looks at the camera. He just, I thought he was looking at me, and I was like, oh, <laughs> look at me. And he looks at me, and he says, and he quotes scripture. And he makes like he's on the cross, mocking the cross. And he says, Jesus wept and laughs. It scared the heck out of me. <laughs> I turned the TV off. And then I looked down. And underneath the TV was a Bible. <laughs> looked at the Bible. And I was like, okay. I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know where to open. So I just opened it one time. I turned right to the holy flip. Yeah. <laughs> I turned right, right to Jeremiah chapter 7. <laughs> These are the words that came to Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs>
swayed by the wind. See, in Galilee, by the Sea of Galilee in particular, one of the most prolific plants was the papyrus reed. The reed was a very common plant. Nothing special about it. It was a very thin plant. It could easily be swayed back and forth by the wind. So what was Jesus asking? What did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a weak man? No conviction? That is swayed back and forth by, by every kind of teaching? Did you expect to see a common man? With a common message? Or maybe you thought you'd see a rich man. A man that just preaches for monetary gain. Who only cares about the outward appearance. Like much of the Pharisees, the preachers of the day. Is that what you expected? No. John is a prophet. In fact, he's more than a prophet. He's a man with the spirit of God. Who, by God's authority and command. He pleads with the lost world for their salvation. Oh, now let's go back to my story. Right. Y'all went to church after that accident. Y'all got my attention. I better go to church after that. Right. I went to the church for the first time, really for the first time in my life, when I stepped foot in that church of disciples. Wow. Over 24 years ago. And I asked myself that question, what am I going to see? Come on. I remember thinking as I drove there, is my life going to change? I've been chasing all these other gods. But is my life going to change now? Is Jesus the Savior of me, of my life? I was hesitant. I wasn't sure what to expect in all of my past experiences. You know, as Jesus mentions, the reed of the rich man, you know, it's actually so relevant today. Yep. Today, churches are common, like reeds Ooh. in Galilee. Wow. There's 20,000 churches in Michigan. Wow. There's thousands here in the Detroit metro. Wow. But sadly, often like a reed, they have a thin message, wow. not much depth. Now, a radical call to repentance. Wow. A radical call for every member to be a sold out disciple. Wow. The message sways with the wind of politics and social agendas of the day. And the message, the thin, weak, convictionless message is delivered by a man in rich clothes in a mega church with an endless budget, not for world mission, but for pop for entertainment in our big village. You said no. This is the Detroit church. Is a church of prophets. To preach the gospel till they die. Breath. I wish, I wish that all the Lord people were prophets and that the Lord would put a spirit upon them. If you can only see what we see today, the kingdom of God, a kingdom of prophets with the Holy Spirit, not just on you, but inside of you, compelling you to preach God's Word. Yeah. Matthew 11, verse 11. John, or Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. He says, Among those born of women, of all the prophets, I mean, think about men like Moses and Abraham and Joseph. Joshua, Joshua, 
heroes of the faith. There's not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Come on. Now, underline this one right here. Come on. Yeah, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Come on, come on. If that doesn't fire you up, come on now. Come on. The least in the kingdom. John the Baptist has done that. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. You know, John was pretty awesome. I mean, his name was John the Baptizer. Yeah. It was so awesome to have him. He preached an amazing message on Friday. He said, hey, you know, John, he, he baptized so many people. They just gave him a nickname, John the Baptizer. That's pretty awesome. But he says, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Why? John the Baptist prepared the way. He came before Christ. He never, he never got to experience being a Christian after Jesus died on the cross. He never got to experience the kingdom. He never got to go to an, an awesome inaugural service. He never got to go to a jubilee where everybody has the spirit. And everyone preaches the gospel. Well, him is just him. He was the only one all by himself in the wilderness eating bugs. <laughs> but in the kingdom, every disciple has the, has the Holy Spirit inside. Every one of us, doesn't matter if you're old or young, you're a disciple. Amen. And we all get to preach the word. You know, I went to church that first time, that's what I saw. I saw two disciples. I remember the guy, he, he preached the lesson, I was like, how does this guy know me? <laughs> How does he know my life? Uh, I'm talking about my sin from last night. How <laughs> is this so relatable? And then I watched everybody and I'm like, how come they're so loving? How come everybody wants to give me a hug? <laughs> I said, this has got to be fake. You can't fake it that good. <laughs> I saw was true disciples. Yeah. You don't have to fake it when you're a true disciple.
disciples. And we want to teach you to make disciples. Amen. Amen. Woo. You can rap about it, or you can go about it, or you can lie about it, I'm just going to tell you. That's we right. want to help you Instead of a spirit of despair, yeah. they will be. 
be called the oaks of righteousness, a planting for the Lord, a of his glory, and they mighty destroy church. Will we build the ancient ruins? <laughs> The ruined city that has been devastated for generations, and to God be all the glory. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Chicago. Uh, we have Cornell and Tia. <laughs>
nine hours a day. His report said no more. And he lowered it to eight hours a day. <laughs> Created three shifts in his auto plan so people could have several days off to be with their friends. He did something that changed the world forever, changed the middle class forever. One year later, in 1915, he changed minimum wage for Ford workers from $2.50 to $5. Down, baby. He doubled the minimum wage for Ford workers from $2.50 to $5. Then he made that change. The very next day, right here in Detroit, right outside the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, 10,000 people quit their job and tried to get hired at Ford Motor Company. Yeah. You might be asking, is he the one? As you're my No, he is not. That's right. The one. But what a message of hope. Yeah. That's what this city is all about. The message that Jeremiah talked about, tens of thousands, was dream to the truth. As he said, we're not a church that's interested in preaching religion. Nope. We just want to preach the truth. Amen. You know, secondly, I love this story. I, I don't know about you, but I just envision the car flipping yeah. over and over. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I think about Jeremiah waking up while the car was flipping over and over. And then the car hits the river. And he says, what am I going to do with my last breath? And I appreciate how he held on to his last Breath. Yep. That's right. For a lot of us, we don't know when our last breath is going to come. But what are you going to do with your last breath? You know, this is this was Henry Ford City until the church got here. <laughs> Henry Ford had an incredible, incredible admiration for a brilliant man. By the name of Thomas Edison. He was so enamored with Thomas Edison and his brilliance and his greatness. He looked up to him as his mentor. Thomas Edison meant more to Henry Ford than any other person on the face of the earth. So much so, when he was on his deathbed, he called his eldest son and he said, I need you to do me a favor. Your dad is so important, so significant, but he takes his last breath. I want you to capture it in a test tube. And his son, when, he, when, when Thomas Edison was taking his last breath, he agreed to it, and he took his last breath into a test tube. And that test tube to this very day is sealed and inside the Henry Ford Museum. Wow. But I ask you today, who's going to get your last breath. Good question. The last breath that you breathe. Will it be a breath of air that will go to Jesus, your Savior? Are you reserving your last breath for Jesus? I don't want my last breath for no museum. Okay. <laughs> I want my last breath. I want my last breath. Yes. Yep. Giving it to Jesus. And I hope it is. Amen. What did you come and see? Well, you saw it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to do? Today? That's right. I hope you'll make changes. Hope you'll come back next week. We won't all be here next week. The service won't be three hours like it is today.
some of you. <laughs> when you try to fill out your response card, yeah. and uh, we'd like you to fill out your response card, put your name in here, your phone number. We'd like to be in touch with you, tell you more about the church, tell you more about who we are, and uh, uh, just have you come back and meet with us again. Now, there's an incentive for filling this out. Okay, bro. There it is, over there on the team. Uh, We've got some goodie baskets over here. I think we got three of them, right? We got three of them. And so three of you are going to have a lot of food. And all the rest of us are going to be want to be your best friends. <laughs> so uh, take some time right now, people. Go ahead and pull out your kid if you would. And uh, go ahead and fill out, uh, go ahead and fill out the uh, response card. Uh, we'd like to know how you guys felt about our service today. We'd like to be in touch with you uh, in the future. Uh, I'd like to bring my incredible, lovely, beautiful, amazing, dynamic, fire. Uh, you know, uh, I, 
I, I got my gift from Jeremiah to inspire him to let the organ ducks go. Yeah. 
This girl is not naked. I will call her. I will find her. <laughs> I will bring her back to the kingdom. So just remember that this is where you belong. Your family and you love you so much. <laughs>
Well, what an incredible day it's been. We're going to pray for the, uh, just the close here. And uh, we're at camp with Grace Sue and myself and Chris Adams. And uh, the, we, the clerks actually asked us to invite everyone next week. Amen. 10 30 service is going to be the banquet hall in Townsville Suites. The address is 46418 North Interstate Link Road Service Drive, Belleville, Michigan, 48111. And uh, y'all have 